Hello, film lovers. It's time for the first ever energy policy film competition. We're very excited about this. Uh, so we have four finalists. We're going to see each. We're going to screen all four films. Uh, Nikita. Filmmakers, uh, when I call your names, please come up uh, and tell us um, where you're from, like as in hometown, uh, what your major is, like what department, whether you're an undergraduate, graduate, what year, and then say whatever you want about your film. And then um, we'll start with uh, Pranav Gori and Varun Deshpande. The film is Chal. Absolutely. We're all for fandism here. That's fine. Challenges and integration of renewable energy in the electrical grid. Gentlemen, it's all yours. Um, hi, I'm Pranav Gore. I'm, from, I'm a graduate student from the Energy Science, Technology, and Policy program. This is Varun. Uh, I'm from Mumbai, India. This is Varun. Even, uh, he's from the Energy Science, Technology, and Policy program. He's from Mumbai as well. And we've chosen the topic challenges faced in integration of renewables into the grid. Uh, people feel that adding more renewables will solve all our problems. Now, that might be true, but then there are some challenges that we face when we do this integration. So, through this video, uh, we're, we're trying to show some of the issues faced in a fun way. Hope yeah. you like it. Just enjoy. Sit back and enjoy. If Leo says it, it must be true. Climate change has led to global warming, rising sea levels, loss of biodiversity and extreme weather events. Most of our electricity is generated using fossil fuels, but solar and wind are increasingly being integrated into the grid to provide clean power. Renewable energy projects are capital intensive and location dependent. They have long project cycles and low efficiency. Certain policies are in place to make this integration smoother. Renewable portfolio standards, project financing options, renewable energy certificates and tax subsidies. Solar and wind have some drawbacks. The major one is intermittency. Wind flows at different speeds and directions. These are hard to predict. Solar is affected by cloud cover and seasons. Like any venture, renewable energy projects have a revenue budget too. Energy generation targets are missed due to intermittency which unsettles this budget. Inability to accurately forecast power generation results in penalties being charged to power producers. Due to current policies and regulations, grid operators are required to consume as much renewable energy as possible. Due to intermittency, grid operators find it hard to manage the grid. As a result of this, some areas can experience degraded quality of electricity or even blackouts. Operational complexity in fossil-based power plants increases due to integration of renewables. The life and quality of equipment is affected. This leads to increased costs for the power producers. Many energy policies aim to intensify the mix of renewables in the grid. Although renewables have their benefits, it's important to consider the challenges they bring along. So that was our Bollywood uh, entry. Um, now we move to consumer preferences in the American transport sector. Rushil Zuchi and Ayush Garg. Gentlemen. Um, hi guys. Uh, good evening. So I'm Rushil. Uh, I'm from Bangalore, India. I'm a um, graduate student in Energy Science, Technology and Policy. My concentration is ECE. This is Ayush. He's also a graduate student from Delhi. Uh, and he's uh, also in ESTP and his concentration is also ECE. So um, what our video is about is basically analyzing consumer trends and preferences in the American transport sector. The two of us have a pretty keen interest in electric vehicles, in transport, basically, um, and how it drives uh, energy markets and things like that. What we also have a keen interest in is data analytics and how uh, large amounts of data and analyzing data and, and observing trends can be used to drive policy decisions. 
So we kind of thought we'd amalgamate the two of these um, spheres and uh, present a video basically on this. So we've looked at um, a lot of different uh, kinds of data and uh, all the data analysis that you see in this video was done by us. So uh, yeah, and this is something that we think can be used to guide policy decisions and we've spoken about that in the video. So hopefully you like it, enjoy. One of the fundamental assumptions that economists make while building models is that consumers are always rational in that they always make choices that maximize their savings or profit. But is that really the case? Buying a vehicle is a big decision. You've slogged through years of college followed by slogging for a few more years to pay off the loan that allowed you to slog through years of college. And now, you can finally afford your own car. So how do most of us choose to spend our money? This video investigates consumer trends and preferences in the American transportation sector. First off, one would expect high gasoline prices to considerably deter consumers. What this graph shows you is that there is a negative correlation between consumer sales and gasoline prices, but a very weak one. But the big boys that want to buy themselves a light truck, they don't really seem to care a whole lot about gas prices. Next, we thought it'd be interesting to look at a couple of specific cars. The ever dependable Chevy Cruze with a fuel economy of 42 miles per gallon and the gas guzzling Ford F-150 with a fuel economy of just 26 miles per gallon. People did seem to opt for the Cruze when gas prices were higher, but sales of the Ford F-150 were unaffected. There's a reason that it's the best selling car in good old Texas. Speaking of fuel economy, there's been a lot of buzz lately about electric vehicles. People claim that Musk, Tesla and the Chevy Volt have revolutionized the market. Electric and hybrid vehicle sales started gaining momentum truly only after 2013. This coincided with three things. The Nissan Leaf dropping its prices by six and a half thousand dollars, the Tesla Model S being launched in late 2012, and the introduction of the e-gallon. In December 2014, when electric vehicles recorded an all-time high in monthly sales, the Tesla Model S and the Nissan Leaf constituted about 80% of all electric vehicle sales. Despite all of these fantastic figures, there's unfortunately no real correlation between gas prices and electric vehicle sales. Evidently, consumers aren't very smart. So what is it that they really prefer? We found out that Americans love America. These graphs represent the ratio by which domestic brands outsell foreign brands. There's been a marked decrease in this ratio in recent years because often the Nissans and the Mazdas are simply cheaper and the Japanese do make a pretty mean engine. All in all, the consumer isn't always king, especially when global warming is the cost we pay. If we really want to create policies that incentivize consumers to move towards cleaner technology, we've got to show them savings and show them savings now, either by making the technology a lot more competitive like the Nissan Leaf, or by simply making the information a lot more accessible like the e-gallon. There's a lot at stake here. Okay. Uh, very good. Well done, gentlemen. We move to our third entry, Distributed Energy Management and Power Systems from uh, Javad uh, uh, Mohammadi, sorry, Javad Mohammadi uh, and Julian Lamb. Ah. Javad and Julian, please. Well, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Javad. I'm a PhD student in Electrical Engineering Department. I'm originally from Iran. And hey, uh, Julian Lamy. I'm a PhD student in Engineering and Public Policy. Finishing up, uh, both of us finishing up this summer, so, hopefully, yeah. right? Um, and so we've been thinking about this problem a lot. It's about how do you get things like batteries. There's been a lot of talk about the Tesla's Powerwall, for example. How do you use those batteries on a grid? And so this is this is kind of a question. Um, that I think policy can address, and that's why we created this video to address that. Our electricity grid was, was built over 100 years ago as a one-way highway of electrons going from power plants to homes and businesses across America. But now, the grid is starting to change. The proliferation of solar rooftops is starting to push energy in the opposite direction, which is starting to cause um, some reliability concerns for utilities. Um, in terms of maintaining frequency and voltage, but also in trying to coordinate across multiple grid assets. And so in other words, this is starting to cause some accidents on the grid. 
One way to try to prevent some of these accidents is to have some kind of control mechanism on the grid. In this case, batteries could be a control mechanism if you were to locate them um, with the solar rooftops. That way, you could control when you're pushing energy from these solar rooftops onto the electricity grid. It's like having a traffic light. The problem with these traffic lights right now, though, is they don't really talk to each other, and so they cause a lot of traffic jams in the system. That's inefficient. A more efficient way of doing it would be to have all these control mechanisms or traffic lights talk to each other. So it's kind of like having a street with a bunch of traffic lights all in sync, as opposed to operating independently. So where are we at right now in making this happen? Well, California is by far the biggest energy storage slash battery market in the world. They're expecting to build about 25 gigawatt hours of storage just to reliably integrate um, enough renewables to meet their 50% renewable portfolio standard in 2030. In addition to that, they have policies specifically designed to increase aggregation and coordination across grid assets, such as the DERP classification by the California ISO and PG&E supply side pilot. Texas, Hawaii, and New York are starting to follow suit. Um, so this is an example of how public policy mixed with technology can be used to solve the problem. And our fourth and last contestant is um, increase our energy innovation budget, Nico Serkera and Maddie Wenzig. Nico and Maddie. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Nico. I am originally from Bogota, Colombia. I'm Maddie. I'm from Portland, Oregon. I'm a master's student in civil and environmental engineering. And I'm a master's student in energy science, technology, and policy. So um, the idea behind this video came after uh, discussions we had with Maddie about all the classes that we're taking and they were related to energy. We didn't seem to agree on many facts. But in the ones we agree were the ones that we thought like will push this energy subject forward, and that was like increase the budget on innovation, energy, innovation, and energy. So we decided to create a uh, to make like a um, creative approach, and to inspire the policymakers to invest more in, in in the budget for energy innovation. So here it is. Energy innovation is a key tool used to address the changing needs of the public with regards to how energy is generated and used. One current goal is to continue the high standard of living that we have today without harming the environment, a high level of comfort that is ultimately due to our energy consumption and demand. Recent developments, such as hybrid vehicles, wind and solar energy, and even LED light bulbs have already changed the way that we think about energy in the environment in our daily lives. New ideas for energy technologies such as these are always being explored, but these ideas need time and funding to develop into products that can be implemented by you and me. In the proposed federal budget for 2016, the U.S. dedicated $12.5 billion towards all energy research, making up only 8.6% spend for any research and development, and just 0.3% of the total $4 trillion in the federal budget. But more can be done. Supporting an increase in funding for energy research and development will accelerate the path of new technologies from the lab into the real world, helping to solve some of the major problems that we face today. Increasing the budget may lead to some downsides, such as temporarily higher energy prices, as well as to perhaps developing some technological dead ends. However, these risks can be mitigated by the innovative outcomes of research in conjunction with decisive policy actions. New technologies can also ensure that our energy use and resulting lifestyles leave less environmental damage than ever before. Whatever the path, let's envision a secure energy future for ourselves in this changing world. That's it. There you have it. Uh, are you going to like yeah. display the choices? Yes, we are, as it okay. is uh, coming on the other computer. It's uh, just about time to vote. Uh, get your clickers out. We have a time. Uh, this is great. So you're all winners, but we knew that going in. Um, so our uh, sharing third place um, will be uh, Rushil Zushi and Ayush Garg and Javad and Julian. 
Let's hear it for them. Come on up. Congratulations, gentlemen. You're each going to get. No, no, no. You're each going to get $150. I mean, you're going to have to share $150. You're each going to get $75. Okay. Uh, our second place uh, goes to Pranav Gore and Varun Deshpandi. Oh, you can stay up. Yeah, that's right. And they get to split $350. Mm -hmm. And you could probably all guess who the winner is. Um, first place is Nico and Maddie. They get the thousand bucks. So uh, let me just say, um, I think it's terrific that you all put the effort in to think creatively about challenging energy problems. And you did choose important and challenging problems. And uh, you know, whatever the um, value is to the viewer, I think there's tremendous value to those who made the film. So congratulations to all of you to take the time to do it. We're proud of you. And well done.